Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to my second episode. I'm going to look at a particular plant this time and its pollinators. And I'm starting in my front garden, not with my focal plant, but just to show you some general principles. This is rosemary. We grow that as a herb, humans. And if I touch it and if I bruise the leaves, I get a really wonderful smell. Now on this rosemary, every time I come out here, I can see bees visiting it. They're not interested in its culinary properties, they're interested in its flowers. But you probably know that not all flowers are the same. Some flowers are really attractive to bees and others are not. And bees are interested in two things that flowers produce. They're interested in nectar, which is a sugary liquid, very high in energy. And bees are flying and burning energy, so they need that nectar. The other thing they are interested in is pollen. The plant, of course, wants them to pick up pollen and transfer it around between flowers, but the bees will take some of that pollen as well uh, and take that home to feed their larvae. Pollen has a lot of protein in it. It's not just sugar. So it's not just empty calories. It's actually got good stuff in it to feed growing bee larvae. Now, if you want to really attract bees, you've got to have enough flowers. And so this rosemary plant is attracting a lot of bees, partly just because it's huge. And in fact, I've got a second one growing near it. And that kind of apparency to insects is really important. And that's what we're gonna look at in the back garden in a minute. We're gonna go and look at another plant, which has got a few clever tricks to try to persuade bees that there's perhaps more on offer than there actually is. So we're around in the back garden now and I'm crouching next to the focal plant. There's been a bit of a gap between me shooting that first sequence in the front garden and coming to do this because unfortunately I've had this COVID-19 virus, or at least I think I've had it, and I was in bed for about eight days. And I was very lucky that I didn't have any of the really serious symptoms that some people have had. But it is a reminder that we're all vulnerable to it and we must follow the advice as closely as we possibly can. You certainly don't want to have it. It wasn't a very nice experience. Okay, well here is my focal plant. It's quite attractive, not a real showstopper, but nice if you come up close to it. I haven't told you what it is yet. And the reason for that is I want you to have a guess. And I'm gonna cut off one of its leaves and show it to you. And I'm gonna to have to wear a glove because I am quite allergic to this plant. And if I touch it, I tend to find that I react to it. So let's chop off a leaf and have a look at it. And what I'm gonna ask you is, what body part does it remind you of? Any guesses? Well, it's supposed to look like a diseased lung. And the reason for that, or, or the explanation, I should say, for why um, that's important in its name, is that in medieval times, uh, herbalism was a big thing. And of course, today, a lot of our medicines do come from plants. Plants produce an incredible array of chemicals. They are the sort of natural pharmacy. And, but we didn't know in, in medieval times what plants were they supposed to use for different ailments. And they developed something called the Doctrine of Signatures. And they decided that obviously God wanted people to heal themselves. And so he would give signs on various plants as to what they should be used for. And because that leaf looks like a diseased lung, they thought that clearly this plant must be used to treat lung conditions. Now it's probably all a bit backwards there, and I think this plant was used to treat lung conditions before the Doctrine of Signatures ever emerged, probably. So a lot of it was a bit, you know, being kind of deciding after the fact. Oh, yes, actually, those leaves do look a bit like a diseased lung. But anyway, this is called lungwort. Now, I certainly don't advise, no matter how bad your cough is, that you start grinding up the leaves of this plant and treating yourself. It has got some very toxic compounds in it, and I don't know whether there's any scientific evidence to show that any 
medicine derived from this plant could actually help you if you had a cough and you certainly shouldn't try to harvest things yourself because plants can vary a lot and some leaves will have a lot of compound in them and some will have a lot less. Now the reason I'm interested in it, we were talking about pollinators and if you look closely, if we just zoom in on this plant for a minute, we can see something a little bit unusual. So the flowers are very different colours and that is very unusual. And if we look here, this is a newly opened flower, it's just starting to open and it's got a lovely pink colour. And as the flowers get a bit older, here's one that's a little bit older and you can see it starts to get suffused with purple. So you can see sort of pink and purple together. And that flower is the oldest one and it's really very blue. Okay, so why is it doing that? Well, that's something that I want to take a look at in more detail and it's to do with its pollinators. Um, that's why that plant is changing colour like that. And scientists have come up with explanations as to why this happens. It's quite a rare phenomenon. And actually the biggest mystery is why more plants don't actually do it. But before we look at what, what the explanations are for this colour change, we need to have a closer look at its main pollinators. The small gingery bee visiting this lungwort is a male of the hairy-footed flower bee. And that's a very common early bumblebee in British gardens. This little black bee is the female of the same species and we can see that she has those little orange blobs on her legs and those are pollen sacs. So she's not just taking nectar, she's gathering pollen to take back and feed her brood of bee larvae. And both of those bees you can see really target the pink flowers. If they land on a blue one it's not for long and mostly they seem to be able to aim straight for the pink ones. Now there are also other insects that visit lungwort. I wasn't able to film it on lungwort, but this is a bee fly. You can see it's a fly because it's such an amazing flyer, able to bullseye those tiny little forget-me-not flowers without even landing on the flowers, just hovering above them. Only a fly can do that. When the bee fly lands and sits down, you can really tell it's a bee fly. See how its tongue is sticking out? A bee tucks its tongue underneath its body. The fly, well, a bit embarrassing really. Okay, so we've just been having a look at some of the pollinators of lungwort. We said the most common one is the hairy-footed flower bee. So how did interactions between the plant and the pollinator drive the evolution of that floral colour change that we can see in the lungwort? i will be glad to know, I've got my Play-Doh out and I'm going to try and show you how it works. So let's have a closer look. I've got three potential lungwort plants here. This is supposed to be the leaf and here's the stem on which the flowers are going to appear. And this plant is going to be what's called the ancestral plant. I'm going to imagine this is how lungwort started and it produced pink flowers. And every day I'm going to assume that the plant produces another flower. So that's day one, day two, day three. But the flowers only last for three days. So on day four, when that flower appears, that one's going to disappear. And on day five, when this new flower appears, that one's going to disappear. And on day six, when the final one appears, that's going to disappear. So the most flowers it's ever gonna have is three. I'm just gonna move them over there for a second, make this a bit easier. Now what if there's a mutant plant that's doing something a bit different? So it opens a flower on day one, a flower on day two, and a flower on day three. But on day four, when this flower opens, it decides to hold on to that flower. Now it's not producing nectar or pollen anymore, so it's not really costing the plant anything, but it just decides to let that flower, the, the old flower, hang on in there. And on day five, it's still going to let that one hang on there. And on day six, it's going to do the same. So on average, these flowers last for six days. But only for three of them, when they're in the first three days, are they actually producing pollen and nectar that's valuable for bees. And these three are a bit old and rubbish. Now the question is, if will this plant do better than this one? And I think the answer is in the short term, yes it would, because it looks much more attractive to the bees and so they might go to this plant in preference to that one. And so this plant will be more successful and we might end up with a lungwort population that looks like this. 
Okay, so that's all well and good, but now the bees are coming to the lungwort plants, and if they arrive first at one of these flowers, the old ones, as they can't tell the difference, then they're going to be really disappointed because there isn't any pollen or nectar there, and they might choose to just fly off again. And so the lungwort might start to suffer as the bees start to realise that this is not a plant to be trusted. It's not sending what we call honest signals. And so a second thing might happen where lungworts have a new kind of change occurs. So here's what might happen now. This plant opens a pink flower on day one, and a new pink flower on day two, and a new pink flower on day three. But then on day four, when it opens a new pink flower, it changes the colour of the old one. Okay. And then on day five, when yet another new one, pink one opens, it changes the colour of the old one. And finally on day six, when the last new one opens, it changes the colour again. I'm going to shove them along and show the really old flower as being really bluey purple. And the question we have to ask now, will that be more successful than that? And I think this will be more successful. And the reason is that bees is still a lot of flowers to attract in the bees who'll come there, but they are targeted at the flowers with the high rewards. So they won't leave quickly feeling disappointed. Instead, they will stay and they will visit the, the, the flowers with the pollen and the nectar. Okay. So it seems that the lungwort has come up with a really great strategy. And I can imagine it evolving like that as a two-step process. First to retain the old flowers, but then as pollinators learned perhaps that the lungwort was cheating on it, to develop this system to change the color of them so that pollinators wouldn't be cheated. And that's an example of what we call co-evolution, where the plant and its pollinator are influencing each other and the way that they evolve. So we're going to end where we began again. We're back at the patch of lungwort. And in fact, I can see a male hairy footed flower bee visiting right now as we speak. This patch of lungwort is in the shadiest, coolest part of the garden and it's still going strong. Some of the other bits where it's been sunnier are finishing now. Lungwort is one of the first plants to flower in the year and that's why it's so important for these very early pollinators. And studies have been done that show that the plant is also highly dependent on that hairy footed flower bee. If it's not allowed access to the flowers, then you get very poor seed set. And actually the lungwort, like the primrose, has that pin-thrum mating system. So it requires pollinators to come and transfer pollen among plants in order that it can set seed. And we learn that it's got this very clever trick of hanging on to the old flowers in order to look like there's more on offer here than there actually is. But when the bees arrive, they don't feel cheated because they know exactly which flowers are offering the best rewards. And they're the pink ones, not the blue ones. And the bees seem to know that and they focus in on those pink ones and spend more time visiting them. And that's also been shown. And if you have some of this plant at home and you want to have a go, you could film it on your phone very easily and then watch and see whether they do seem to target the pink ones when I've done that I feel like they really do do that but I haven't really quantified that properly or anything if you want to grow lungwort and you haven't got it in your garden it's really really easy to grow it from seed and once you've got it it spreads very easily and you can move it around your garden you can move the seedlings around it's tough as old boots it'll grow anywhere and it's particularly good for growing in what's called dry shade that's underneath trees it's specialized on doing that at the moment it can grow under trees because most of the trees haven't really leafed out yet properly and once the trees leaf out they take all the light they suck up all the water and they make life very difficult for anything growing underneath. Anyway, that's the end of this today's or this this week's show and hopefully we'll be back again next week and hopefully we'll all be recovered in this household anyway from this horrible virus and I hope you're staying safe at home as well. <laughs>